Thank you, Rod. I'll, um, I'll give you the cash afterwards for that. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not a member of the SDP, but I just want to say at the outset, I really, really like what I'm hearing today. You, you are in the sweet spot, what I've called the sweet spot of British politics, in that you're leaning a little bit left on the economy and you're leaning a little bit right on culture. And that's basically where the average voter is. You wouldn't believe that if you listen to our national conversation or people like Gary Lineker, <laughs> strangely quiet this week. But um, that is where the average voter is. And I know that. I poll voters every week. I sit in focus groups with voters every week. And what they're looking for right now is one word, security. They're looking for economic security from the cost of living, from the sharpest decline in living standards for half a century. They're looking for physical security from a collapsing national health service. They're looking for national security from the small boats and a model of mass immigration, which is not just broken in terms of the economy, but which is upending and overturning our national culture and our ways of life. And they are looking for cultural security from the advance of a radical woke progressivism, which is undermining and eroding our institutions and our sense of who we are. And security is, is the framework for the rest of this decade, because many of the things that I've just referred to are only going to, in my view at least, accelerate and from the perspective of that average voter, get worse. Very few people in this country think the economy is going to get better over the next 10 years. Very few people in this country think either the left, the established left, the established right are going to manage immigration and that it's going to get better in the years ahead. Very few people genuinely think the National Health Service is going to improve and very few people think that the mainstream parties represent people like them. So the space for new insurgent parties who are willing to be brave and outspoken and radical and speak on behalf of not just a fringe minority, but 60, 70% of the country is enormous. That space is enormous. And it's been created by an elite project which we are now living through, an elite project which is rapidly losing its way. And we can all sense it and we can all feel it, but it's an elite project that, as I've argued, is losing its way in really three respects. Firstly, as we've seen again this week, we have an elite ruling class that is imposing its values on the rest of the country, values that people neither recognize nor particularly respect, values that cater to about 20% of the country, which would describe itself as strongly and consistently economically and socially liberal, leaving 80% of the country feeling as though they're not represented at all. You can see this most visibly on an issue I talk a lot about, which is mass immigration. Not because I have a problem with immigration, but because we all can see quite clearly that it's being used as a short-term fix for longer-term structural problems in this country. It's the opposite of what people thought they were getting in 2016. What we've seen instead is a liberalization of the migration system alongside the continuation of an economic model that has been put into place to serve the interests of big business and a ruling class at the expense of ordinary working people. That is obvious. Everybody in this room can see that. It's not only mass migration where we can see this elite project coming unstuck. It's also in terms of the issue of political correctness and radical progressivism. 
Uh, I recently did a project for some MPs who will remain nameless. They said, what are the big issues that people feel really concerned about, but also feel that they're not represented on? These are the three issues that should guide your election campaign, I would argue, going into 24. The first, by a long shot, was what I've just discussed, migration. The second was political correctness. 60% of people in this country no longer feel they can say what they want to say because they're worried about the consequences. Don't use the word woke. Only 50% of the country know what that means. Use the words political correctness. 95% of Brits know what that means. And I think why it's becoming so powerful and emotional in politics is because people can now see how it's impacting their children. And if you have read anything, of, um, anything that, I've, that I've been writing over the last year, um, much to the irritation of my colleagues in the universities, um, what we are seeing in the schools and universities is, is nothing short of a political project being imposed from above, advocating and spreading radical belief systems, whether radical gender ideology or critical race theory, that have no basis in science and which are hardwired to push our children apart. That is what is happening up and down the country uh, today. If, if you still don't believe that, please read some of the columns uh, that I've done over the last year, some wonderful work by groups like Don't Divide Us, among others, who have tracked through freedom of information requests what is actually happening in our schools. Uh, and increasingly, our children are being taught that the only interesting and significant thing about them is not their character, but is simply their gender identity or their race. And this has to stop. And when people say this is a divisive culture war, don't use that language. Because sex-based rights, women's rights, the rights of children, our shared history, our shared identity are not divisive, toxic, socially unacceptable culture wars. They are the basis of our civilization. They are what define who we are. Don't use the word culture war. And there are very easy things that we could be calling for to fix that problem. Most of the people who are spreading those ideas in our schools and universities are external providers who are brought in because the schools don't really know what they're doing. We don't regulate them. We don't monitor them. They're not forced to make their materials accessible to mums and dads up and down the country. And our government is failing to instruct schools to adhere to the legal requirement to remain politically impartial. It's very straightforward in terms of fixing that problem. It's not hard to do. It's not only that uh, this elite project is imposing mass migration and radical uh, progressivism. Uh, we can also see how it's still committed ultimately to a model of globalization that is hardwired to benefit the big cities, the university towns, the elite graduate class at the expense of everybody else. Leveling up was not seriously pursued as a government policy. Leveling up should have been about the redistribution of economic, social, and political power, not just sending a few government departments to Northern England. Do you know we now spend more money each year, four billion pounds, on fixing our broken asylum system than we are spending leveling up all of Northern England. That is outrageous. It's outrageous, and it reflects the policy priorities uh, of the people who are uh, running, running the country. And this is why about 60% of Brits say neither left nor right represent me anymore. And it's exacerbated by the way in which, as we've seen with the BBC this week, our institutions are no longer giving those people sufficient voice. Whether you look at our political institutions in Westminster, the civil service, the BBC, the creative industries, the publishing industry, the cultural institutions, the museums, the galleries, the schools, the universities, this is not a conspiracy. 
what has happened is quite simple. As those institutions have become more dependent upon elite graduates from privileged backgrounds who tend to share the same values, as they've drifted way to the left on cultural questions, they've taken the institutions with them. It's not a conspiracy. It's simply polarization, and we are then left dealing with the consequences of a national broadcaster that can't decide when a terrorist is a terrorist. We're left with schools that are imposing openly political dogma on our kids because they think it's appropriate. We're left with a national health service which increasingly looks like a political social movement, not an impartial and independent public service. And we're left with civil servants who think it's acceptable to threaten to strike because they don't agree with policies that are being pursued by a democratically elected government. That essentially is what is happening in many of the institutions. So we need to reform the institutions. We need to ensure that there is genuine viewpoint diversity in the institutions. One of the reasons why my friends and I fought so hard for the Higher Education Academic Freedom Act, which is pretty much the only decent thing this government has done, which basically creates a legal requirement on universities to preserve and promote free speech on campus, is because we could no longer rely on the institutions to reform themselves. They refuse to do it. So when you look at institutions like the universities, which have moved from the 1960s, where there were three academics on the left to every conservative, to today, where there are 10 academics on the left for every conservative, and if you're gender critical, if you're a historian with a more nuanced view of our history, if you're a scholar who questions gender ideology or critical race theory, it is basically open season. As Kathleen Stock and others will tell you, harassment, discrimination, bullying is, is commonplace now within Britain's universities. And we had to bring that legislation forward in order to defend free speech and free expression. But now that we've done that in the universities, we need to now turn to the schools. We need to turn to the civil service. We need to turn to the institutions in Westminster. We need to start asking tough questions as we are this week about the BBC and our national broadcaster. And we need to start forcing the national conversation to open up and give better expression to a full diversity of views that exist in this society because it isn't happening. That's why we're all in this room, because we can sense that the political consensus has narrowed and the prevailing cultural orthodoxy is leaving millions of people out in the cold, no longer feeling as though they're involved in this public square and in this conversation. And thirdly, we need, as um, Laura just said, and many of the other speakers have alluded to, we have to push back against this utterly divisive brand of identity politics. One of the big misinterpretations of my book, by the way, was that I was only talking about people in the Labour Party and on the left of politics. But this new elite ruling class is just as visible within the Conservative Party. If anything, it's more visible within the Conservative Party party that over the last 13 years has done almost nothing at all to stop the onward march of radical progressivism, a party that's done nothing at all to slow down migration. We no longer talk at all about the integration of migrants, by the way. Have you noticed that? We used to talk about things like community cohesion. We used to talk about integration. Uh, we no longer talk about that at all. And a Conservative Party that for the last 13 years, if anything, has allowed these radical ideologies and these viewpoints to flourish, a party that's much more comfortable even today helping financial services in London than actually coming up with a serious plan for rebooting productivity and growth in other regions of the country. So I think the space here is enormous, especially for a party that can go out to the country and remind people that what we need is a unifying narrative about why we are sharing this place that we call home that isn't simply about our racial, sexual, and gender identity. And that vacuum that has been created over the last 20 years is absolutely enormous. And in my view, at least, it starts and ends with the nation state. That is the story that we have to tell to our fellow citizens, that this is a remarkable nation state with a remarkable history a remarkable culture, uh, and a rem has, which has made a remarkable contribution to the wider world. And we need to be brave and confident 
and forward-looking in telling that story to our fellow citizens and reminding them about that story. Because if we don't, I think it's quite clear who is going to be the real winner at the election next year. It will be apathy. One of the reasons why Brexit was pushed over the line was because two and a half million people who didn't usually vote came out to vote. They could sense that there was this opportunity for something different. What I suspect we'll see next year in some parts of the country are many of those people actually saying they're not going to vote at all. If you look at the people that took a punt on Boris Johnson and the Conservatives in 2019, only about 60% of them are currently planning on voting at the general election next year. So again, there's an enormous opportunity for this party to get out there and to speak to many of those people because the diagnosis, your diagnosis of British politics is absolutely correct. Your diagnosis of what needs to be done and what people are looking for is absolutely correct. I, I poll voters all the time. Your manifesto would be very, very popular if more of them knew about it. And that is why it comes down to people like you knocking on doors and pushing leaflets through and going on television and making the argument. Because out there, there is a consensus that the old politics is broken. There's no enthusiasm for Keir Starmer and the Labour Party. There's a reason his leadership rating is <laughs> minus 12. There's no enthusiasm for any of the big parties in British politics at the moment because we can all sense that we're living through the construction of a new big consensus in British politics. Uh, high tax, big state, mass immigration, more globalization, London-centric, obsessed with the middle class, and forget about everybody else. That's the consensus that is once again dominating British politics. And it's up to you to remind people for why there could be something very, very different and very, very special. So I wish you luck with the campaign. I'll watch it very closely. And um, if I can be of any help during that period, please drop me a line. And thank you very much.